friend, this is me. And me again. I take, I take my mini-me off saying, thank you very much for joining us for the live show today. I hope it's going to be good. It was very good last week. If you like us, please click that button on YouTube and subscribe. It really helps. From the home of creative writing on the internet. And now, here is your host, Peter Cox. Yeah, hello. Very, very good to be back with you again. It was a good show last week, wasn't it? That's quite high standard to beat this week. Who knows? We may well do. Our amazing guest is Emma Reed, who's an author and very famous for being Emma Reed. <laughs> and it's Dean. We all know Dean. We all love Dean. He shares a bookcase with another famous guest on this show. It has been observed. Let's see what's going on for you, Emma. What's, what's been happening in the, in the few weeks since we last saw you? Oh, well, it's been all go here. It's really exciting. Yeah. Um, I've been to the cafe. I've oh. been to the pub. <laughs> I've been to the hairdressers. Oh, you're making me and jealous. I've been to a bookshop. You lucky, lucky thing. Oh, it's been great. You're moving out of <laughs> lockdown. Isn't that brilliant? Yeah. yeah. Uh, what's on your, um, your night table for reading? Um, at the moment, I have just finished, finished reading Will Dean's uh, Last Thing to Burn. Yes. Uh, I've got... Um, that was actually... OK, so let's just make this really clear. I was giving okay. you a hint there to introduce your chosen book. I wasn't oh. literally... I, just, <laughs> I thought you were just, you know, no, generally you, 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 you can tell. You can tell. We, okay. don't, we don't rehearse this. You can tell. Yeah, what's your book of the week? OK, my book of the week is um, Jelly by Claire Reese. Yeah. Uh, and I'm just going to read you the, the little caption on the front, which you can probably see there already. It says, mm. trapped on a jellyfish. Oh, my yeah, God. Really? Yeah. Um, and that perfectly sums up this book. It's a YA dystopian. Um, but, and, you know, yawn. We, we, there's so many YA dystopians. We get a lot of that, this, that's for sure. This is different. This is, the author has just gone, what if a bunch of people were stuck on an enormous jellyfish in the middle of the sea? I like it. Um, let's go with that. Um, yeah. I, I love it. I'd buy it just on that. Fantastic. Thank you, Emma. Same thing to you. Not literally what book is on your night reading stand. <laughs> let's make that really clear. That was a metaphor for what book would you like to introduce us to, Dean? Um, this week I've gone with uh, How To Be Both by Ali Smith. Okay. Hmm, interesting. And it yeah, is? I mean, it's Ali Smith's, it, she's a bit of an anomaly for me because I don't normally like so called literary fiction and I tend to like, um, you know, things to be a story to get going quite quick and things like Good that. Good story, and so, yeah. Yeah, and some of her stuff is, um, you know, you don't really know what the hell's going on, to be honest. But yeah. her writing is so accomplished um, and the way, hmm. you know, the way she plays with language and words. Um, mm. and I think she's actually been compared to Dickens before. She's, you know, that yeah. kind of witty writing. Um, it's just a joy, to be honest. And so I've actually ended up reading most of her stuff. Um, hmm. uh, but I've singled this one out, How To Be Both, because it's, it's, apart from the, the quality of the writing, it's an interesting kind of concept in that you've got two stories going on. Uh, one in modern day, um, which is a story of a teenage girl called George. Um, and then uh, alongside that, you've got the story um, of a 15th century Renaissance painter called Francesco. Yeah. Um, but depending on it, which copy you happen to pick up, the stories could be in a different order. So it's kind of a random... Um, Oh, right. Really how interesting. Yeah, I wonder so how they did that. You get the same story, but it's just that, there's, that they split it up differently. But yeah. Depending on which one you've picked up, the, the kind of the... Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, the texture of the book is going to be a bit different because you're... Very interesting. Story. Very yeah. interesting indeed. Yeah. Uh, in, invites people to sort of get together and say, how was yours? Wow, well, mine was different yeah. to yours. Yeah, I love exactly. it. Yeah, I love it. I Great idea. You, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I wish you're reading the same story. I think if you're reading it in a different order, it does make... It, it does give a different flavour to it. Got it. And understood. Let's look at those two recommendations there last time. Get a chance to scan the QR code there. We use QR codes quite a lot. 
make a priority submission at priority.latopia.com. Yeah, now let's catch up on what happened last week. It was quite a show, actually, as you may remember. Um, our guests include a new face for the first time on Pop Ups. We had Liverpudley and author Jack Byrne, as well as the always popular Kaylee Finn, who shares a bookcase with Dean. Um, here's how the voting went. We gave Journeys Promised by Johnny Hall 45%. You said 45%. So far, so good. We're in agreement. Jordan Burke's Summer of 71 got a 70 on the show. We like that. You said... Oh, he went a bit low on that. You said 60. You're never wrong. Mary's Good Time and Old Legeriton. I'm still not sure if I've got that pronunciation right. Got 60 on the show and you said... 67.27, to be precise. The Stories We Carry by R.A. Ray was the joint winner on last week's show with a very impressive 80%. And you said 75%. James Dixon, a novelist, playwright, poet based in Glasgow, wins with his middle grade magical realism entitled The Billow Maiden with a popular vote of, yes, exactly the same as what we said, 80%. Congratulations, James. Strong show, very strong submission. We all liked it. And that includes the greater, wider reading public. And just a reminder that you can vote. Even though you may not be watching this show live, you may be watching the recording somewhere. You've got six and a half days until next uh, Sunday lunchtime to exercise your vote on these submissions. Let's see the first one today. This is called Heavenly Bodies. It's from Michael, and it's fantasy slash comedy. What a great way to start the show. And this is Michael's blurb. Jimmy's an angel. He works for a lookalike agency in heaven. He's Jimmy Ready Mix. He also tutors promising earthbound musicians. Unfortunately, he's a show-off as well. He walks on water and provokes an almighty row with hell. Baphomet kidnaps him and drags him to her lair. A rescue mission is planned by his earthly protege, Lisa, and colleagues, Kenneth Williams and Richard Quire. Victor, a disgruntled hell resident who was sent to hell by mistake, joins the mission. All right, let me tell you about Michael. Uh, I'm a new writer. And this is my first novel. I'm from Sheffield, a graduate of Sheffield Hallam University. Most of my life, I've worked in social housing as a housing officer. Very good. We want to give you an excellent launch, uh, Michael. And so we've got Emily to read it. The, first the Billow Maiden by James, read by Kate. Things began to get bad over the last few weeks before the summer holidays. It was Ailsa's first year in secondary school. She hadn't long turned 12 and her mum... OK, so that's complete. That's our first cock up of the day. Very sorry about that, everyone. Um, let me... Um, let me get this working properly. It might be a little bit harder to do, actually. And I thought something is not displaying here. It will be soon. Here we go. It's not showing, is it? Hmm. Very curious. Okay. Got it. Very sorry, Michael. Here we go. The first Only page. Bodies by Michael. Read by Emily. Chapter 1. In the Beginning. Victor hesitantly stands from a crouched position. He looks down into the green valley below at the family farm, his face red and eyes fearful. A slow stream of smoke flows from the crooked chimney. Sheets blow on the washing line in the breeze. 
He sees the kids kicking a ball back and forth and his wife, cross-armed, leaning on a wall. This is their farm, their life, all their dreams were born here. It provides an income, a home and hope for the children's future. Victor takes deep breaths as though winded, but he struggles to fill his lungs. His chest is tight, his heart beats like a drum and he is lightheaded, making him unsteady on his feet. He fumbles in his trouser pocket and removes a handkerchief. His shaking hand dabs the sweat from his forehead. Victor Sheridan is a huge red-haired man standing at six foot three in his stocking feet and weighing in at 240 pounds. It's fair to say he's a mountain of a man. His long hair moves in the blustering wind and apart from his eyes and heaving chest, it is the only movement from his body. He would be on any other day. An emotionally stable man, a solid character, resolute and strong, but not today. Maybe from a distance he'll appear steadfast, but closer inspection reveals fear in his face and a tear in his eye. He shows a vulnerability which hasn't been seen since he was a young boy. He slowly scans as far as he can, acre after acre. He sees green pastures with spasmodic white specks. The white specks are their flock of sheep. Hundreds of them. The realisation that they are in distress, all of them, fills him with dread. They lay on the grass, some motionless, already expired. The remainder struggle to raise their heads and take the final gasp for air. Victor waves his arms frantically and shouts down to the farm, but they don't see or hear. They carry on with their game. Victor crouches again. He cradles a lamb in his huge, well-worn hands as it fades and dies. He looks down and then throws his head back and roars a question to the sky. God in heaven, why have you allowed this to happen to us? Who knows, Victor? However, you'll be able to ask him yourself soon. I'm Abraham. You can call me Abe, though. Your guide, your own little encyclopedia, and your window into the afterlife. I'm an angel. You know one of those celestial beings, dressed in a white, frilly lace dress, with a halo hovering above my head. Oh, And don't forget the wings on my back, which are obviously too feeble to support my weight. Here, come, move closer. A word in your shell, like. Listen, don't believe anything you've read about angels in heaven. It was all concocted a long time ago to make heaven look appealing to the great unwashed. I'm obviously a good person like they told you an angel would be. I led a good life for I wouldn't be an angel. I'd be in another place. Wink, wink. I go about my business doing angel-like things, helping others, being kind. I spread angel dust wherever I go. I do. I also sell cocaine, heroin and speed at reasonable prices. Ha! Of course I don't sell drugs. I'm just pulling your plunker. I'm greedy and take them all myself. That was a little banter to break the ice. Don't grasp me up for jesting about such sinful behaviour though, or I'll be making a one-way trip to God's naughty step which is getting a little crowded of late, I'll tell you. Anyway, Victor's question will remain unanswered for now, but there is another one we need to discuss. It is one which is asked more frequently than Victor's, and with all due respect to him, it is a more profound one. This question encourages more debate than just about any other. It's been asked throughout the ages, yet you have no consensus, no verified answer. The question is, are there aliens in Area 51? Okay, um, interesting reactions in the chat room. Where's the story, please, says Eva. Galadriel says comedy. Johnny says low-key start. Kate says, this feel like, feels like it goes with a different blurb to the one we just saw. And Vagabond Heart says, all the men I know wipe the sweat off with their sleeves. <laughs> I wonder if that says a lot about you, actually, Vagabond. Emma, what did you think to that? Um, yeah, so as we're going through, I'm sort of concurring with um, what's in the chat room. In a first page, I like to get an idea of what the story is going to be, what's to come, um, you know, what's the writing style, what is this writer going to, um, the, the journey that we're going to be taken on. And this wasn't setting the scene for that. So, I, you know, I wasn't yeah. getting the comedy. I wasn't yeah. even getting Angels in Heaven to start with. No. So I think start with... Um, the angel as the character and let's see that um that character come to life and be funny be funny that's good advice yes dean 
Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm similar. I think um, he's probably got a story there somewhere, and I think you know, in the blurb, we could see that there was some potential there. But yeah. I just, don't, I think he needs to go. This, this, this not fleshed out properly yet. I mean, it did feel a bit like it was just almost like a list at points, like it was kind of. Yeah, he was telling us about the about the guy's character rather than showing that that to us, and it was, you know, um, we, we weren't getting that characterization from him. I didn't really feel any. I didn't know anything about this character or warm to him because I was just kind of being told about his character rather than being oh, shown no. reaction. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think. I, I mean, again, I don't think the writing was too bad actually. I think, and there was some little bits of comedy in there. Um, I just think that yeah, a little bit more tweaking. Oh, more tweaking. Dean wants more yeah. tweaking. I want more laughing. Actually, uh, Kate says from YouTube, uh, the writer started at the wrong place for a strong start. It's overwritten. A strong start would start with the giant of a man and his dread and his fear taking the sight of the dying sheep. Okay, maybe it would, Kate, but um, I just, it's not making me laugh, actually. That's the thing, Michael. Uh, um, one, um, you've, got, you've got to make me laugh, right, if it's humor. It's very difficult to do. Not me specifically, just humorous writing in general. Um, best line for me was our page or two in about um, angel dust. Also, and I also sell cocaine, heroin and speed at reasonable prices. That's quite funny. That could be up front. You know, we had to work through an awful lot of actually quite sad stuff before we got to that. Uh, so I think you're kind of warming yourself up. Um, I've got real doubts about the genre commercially. It's something that's been done for decades, if not hundreds of years. And the big question I know that I would be facing were I to uh, take this out to publishers is they, they want to know, well, what's different about it and why now? That's always a difficult question. It's, it's a question they throw at you when they, they can't see a good reason to publish. Why, why should we publish this now? And that's not being answered, really. Um, and I, I, what we need is a forceful response from you to that. Why now? The answer, I think, if I may humbly suggest you, is because I've got this soggingly good story to tell in an interesting, fascinating, humorous way. And you've just got to charge straight in and do that. Um, let's come back to you, Emma, and ask you for a number, please. Between one and five. Um... I wasn't taken with it. I'm sorry, right. Michael. Um, it's a two for me. That's a two, yeah. So that is a baseline from Emma today, Dean. Yeah, I feel a bit tight about this, but um, yeah, I'm in the same place. And where, where it is at the minute, I'll go, yeah. go over two. That's what we've got to judge. It's a two from Dean. And yeah, I mean, sometimes, you know, we do get a bit carried away. I do as well. And we, we think there's so much promise in this. I'm going I'm to give it another, you know, another few marks. But strictly speaking, we do have to judge what we see in front of us. And right now, uh, on the basis of the writing that, that we've shown, I also am going to go for two. I would be very interested to see what the chat room's doing. Oh, they've gone for a two as well. It's two's all round. Uh, it's not 30. That will go up in a few seconds' time when my score gets added on. There we go. You got a 40, Michael. Nothing to be embarrassed about, but lots of room for improvement. Let's go straight on to the second submission of the day. It's The Geist World by Ian and his fantasy. This is Ian's blurb. As if the fetid trenches and daily peril from speakers wasn't bad enough, Ashlyn Waring's fortune goes from bad to worse. Six months ago, he saw his brother incinerated by a single word from a speaker. Oh, I get the idea. Since then, He's gone on to drown his sorrows in liquor until he's called back to active duty. Top Brass believes they've recovered an artefact that will create speakers of their own. They want him to guard it, but little do they know, he's already connected to it. In a way, no one could guess. Oh, well, you've hinted. Uh, let's tell everyone about Ian. Um, I've been writing books for something like 10 years. And The Geist World is my seventh completed novel. I'm living in Huntsville, Alabama, with my unbelievably awesome wife and two kids. I also enjoy singing, songwriting, and I record my own music. You are veritably a Renaissance man, Ian, so I think the least we can do is to get our own Renaissance man to read it for you. The first page. The Geist World by Ian. 
read by Robert. 1. Brandy and Water On the northern banks of the River Essin, a farthing before it plunges into the watchful eye of Lake Laos, and half a day's train ride from the Sea of Sinovis, a city stands in the twilight of the world. The ruby of the Essin, the Pilgrim's Way, the southern fortress of Stadia. Its crimson tower still catches the light of the westering sun and sends it showering over the waterfront until the Essin blushes like a virgin on a wedding night. Desha is its name, long crowned, long coveted. It knows no equal along the river and turns its back to the great cities of the north. Here it is sovereign, and every wave that bows upon its shore pays it tribute. The bells of its old churches call forth the sun every morning, the music of its theatres lull it to sleep every evening. The crowd of pilgrims, the smoke of incense, the shouts of children, all create the music of the sleeping giant. Over this grand cabaret presides the crimson tower, Solemn and sacred, like the gravestone of a god, it supervises the sons of Desha as they clamour into trains, and their mums moan and wave small kerchiefs, long drenched by tears. And it bears witness when those same kerchiefs cover the closed eyes of the returning. There is only one corner of the city where its light never touches, one small row that dwells in darkness. A bad memory, pushed to the back of the great sovereign's mind, but one it can never seem to forget. The grey lanes. Here lie the taverns, the gentlemen's clubs, and all manner of carnal pleasures, each more unseemly than the last. They hide in the shadow of the great tower, like roaches beneath a boot that never falls, and all the days long the shiftless amble the alleys, sotting out of selfishness, or sotting out of sympathy. At the very end of the row, where the shadow lies heaviest, a peculiar building looks out of place. It is formed in a large blue circle with a massive keg perched atop it. The Brandy Well, a haven for drunkards who claim to retain a shred of dignity, though the whores who visit would tell differently. Strings of lights Festoon the inner walls, giving off a golden glow that turns hazy orange through the smokes of a dozen cigars, and all around the bar sits the regular crowd. Factory workers, hard-time veterans, and old rivermen swap tired stories, and no one takes notice of the, far, of the man at the far corner, who sits apart. A stranger might guess in mid-thirties, but they would be a decade wrong. His shoulders droop under the weight of his finely tailored, grease-stained suit, and his hair has grown out in tight curls and matted together like a briar patch. The sleeves of his blue turtleneck are rolled up to the elbows, revealing dark, sinewy arms, and his brown eyes blink through sweat as his lips move in a noiseless chant. If one were very observant, they would notice two more details. First, Three piercings in the top of his left ear, now only vacant holes, but a sure sign of past military service. Second, they would see the scrap of paper, clutched between his hands, like scripture. Another? He looks up at the voice of the barkeep, his glazed expression betraying his drunken state. He wordlessly pushes his flagon across the counter and watches as malt beer gushes from the tap spattering drops to the floor below. What's your name, friend? The barkeep asks, sliding the full flagon across. He looks down at the scrap of paper again, his brow furrowing as though he can't remember. Ashlyn, he mutters. You got a last name? Ashlyn Waring. Waring? Waring? Can't say I've met any Warings. You from round here? Ashlyn shakes his head. All right, I've just seen you in so often, I started to think you were local. You staying long? Just for a while. On leave of absence? Ashlyn looks up sharply. The barkeep is more observant than most. Yes, 
All right, so I tried to sell that really hard, really hard here into the chat room. I don't think they're completely buying it, actually, the juniors room, pardon me. Don't mean to insult them. Um, I'm looking at Lex, who says, before it scrolls off, this is very old school, give us lots of descriptions of setting, before a protagonist's not sure it'll fly these days. I kind of agree with that, actually, Emma. Yes, I um, agree too. It's the the writing was really beautiful, mm-hmm. um, but it just needs to get to the point more quickly. So my advice would be um, to just cut all of the sections down as much as you can. So the description of the city, then we get to the grey lanes, and you say this is this is quite nice. Um, just get there much more quickly, and after all of that description, uh, and I think. It's, this has been mentioned as well none of it's that original um, no, we've seen this kind not. of setting before mm, yeah. um so you need to get when you get to the dialogue it's got to really pack a punch i want yeah. to see something new and fresh from this character from this dialogue to make me want to read um keep reading read on yeah yeah i couldn't agree more with that dean yeah yeah i agree with Emma and, and the chat room i mean there's not really much i can add to that um, didn't have any qualms with the writing whatsoever, but yeah, it just it needs to get to the story quicker. I think the, the biggest thing is we need to get to a character quicker because if you don't get a protagonist, a protagonist in there fairly mm. soon that you can engage with, people are just going to um, they're going to zone out, which is what I started yeah. to do towards the end of it. I mean, I think we yeah, just, it's not a good sign when when, when you when you've got to focus your attention deliberately, is it? I mean, you yeah, know, I one hopes that you really you get seduced. End, about seven hundred words before we actually got yeah. the dialogue. Um, yeah, and even when the character did come in, there was a lot of description there as well. Of, that was probably not that necessary at that point, of like how he was dressed and things like that. Um, but yeah, again, kind of mirroring what everybody else has said, it just needs to get there quicker. It needs a lot of editing, but writing, yeah. Is a bit so Annie's saying, afraid there's no hook uh, yet. Uh, even the way the main character is introduced has been done many times, many many times ago. But the writing's good. So that's basically uh, that kind of sum, sums up what we've all been saying really i think thank you honey um i got a very small point for you actually and very small but it's funny how these things work okay so you used a word stadia s-t-a-d-i-a in the first paragraph i immediately think google stadia immediately because it's basically it's a it's an, yet another one of google's failing operations whether is it going to be around in a, in a few months or a year or two we don't think it is do you want us to be thinking about that? <laughs> a and B are the trademark implications. That's not quite so important, but the thing is, you know, words have meanings and associations with people. And I think if you you just got to be careful because you're, especially in the opening paragraph, you're throwing us all kinds of new words you've created you've created for new towns and landscapes and things. And you've just got to be aware that they might have other connotations in the real world. Uh, coming back to you, Emma, for a number, please. I liked some of the um just just some of the flow of the writing and the the descriptions were beautiful i think if you can hone that it will be good so i'm going to give it a three three i could tell a three was coming i I felt the pent-up energy there the psychic three yeah dean yeah i'm I'm going to toe the line again um for, for the same reasons, you know, the, the, I think there, there was in, there was some enjoyable writing in there, and I think it's got some potential. Um, so yeah, for that reason. All oh, right, yeah, three two. Um, this is turning into an incredibly boring show in terms of uh, <laughs> voting. I'm going to do the same. Sorry, <laughs> I could be the odd man out, but I can't honestly. It is a very slow build, actually, and um, you've got to give me a reason to turn the page in this day and age. Um, you really have, and you know, attention spans and one thing and another, which we might talk to Emma about actually in a moment. Attention spans because uh, she uh, she deals with um, people who are the sort of sharp end of all that stuff at the moment. Um, yeah, so I suspect that it's going to be threes all round. Are you bored? Are you stuck on the loo? Do you need something to listen to? Well, why not listen to Short Story Hunters on Apple Podcasts and all other leading wow. podcast platforms every Friday. Don't Short like Story people. Hunters, written in a flash by you. <laughs> well, there you go. I mean, what can I say? I, I, I just I just push the buttons, guys. Nothing to do with me. He's doing very well, apparently. 
It's doing very well. Yeah, getting lots and lots of... Uh, Marion Keys tweeted about it the other day, can you believe? Wow, Barbara and, Barbara and Johnny, aren't they doing well? Let's have a look at our third submission of the day, shall we? This is Gods and Demons. Ooh, I'm thinking Tom Hanks. Have I got that right? YA Fantasy is from Maria. Maria Brissanaki. 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 That's close enough, isn't it? Just a tip. Please give me pronunciation guides. Just assume that I'm completely ignorant about almost everything like that. And um, I will mangle your name if I have the opportunity to do so. So just spell it out phonetically for me. Uh, also, uh, personal pronouns. Let me know. Let me know. Um, so here's Maria's blurb. What if the coming of the apocalypse is the only way for two siblings to love each other? Half-blood warrior Meg should only care about one mission, kill humans. Prisoner in a military academy in the Rocky Mountains, she must be trained for that purpose. But she doesn't. Actually, she is the academy's troublemaker. She hates her brother, causes problems, fights. Problems slash fights. Fights with slashes. Breaks rules. Falls in love with a forbidden guy. Plus... <laughs> I love the pluses and the slashes. Plus, discovers deadly secrets. Gods exist and intend to bring the apocalypse with her help. Okay, so that was an unusual blurb there, Maria. Um, thank you, Anne-Marie from uh, YouTube Live. Yeah, we got kind of random um, capitalizations there. Huh? It's not a good idea to do that. We do get a lot of submissions like, like that. Sometimes every word in caps. And it doesn't create a good impression, actually. So let's not let's not do that anymore. <laughs> let's not do, let's not do that anymore. Uh, I'll tell you about uh, Maria, a writer in the mornings and a creative writing teacher in the afternoons. I live in Greece, where I attended creative writing classes, and I'm the writer of the YA fantasy series Gods and Demons, which has been published in Greece by the public, publishing house Likafos. I'm sure I've said that wrong me too uh, and only in greek language is being read by both women and men 14 to 50 years old this new edition english edition differs from the first not only in language but also in plot and hasn't been published i've also completed the adult paranormal fantasy romance uh, evil games also inspired by greek mythology that's quite interesting i'm currently working on a new fantasy series based on the greek and chinese mythology okay that's very cosmopolitan of you Let's try and get the most cosmopolitan reading we can get from Kate. The first page. Gods and Demons by Maria. Read by Kate. Chapter 1. Invisible. I'll be invisible. I took a deep breath to summon up some courage and allow my words some time to be impressed upon my mind. Invisible. Invisible. I won't fail this time. The silence bell had long ceased ringing, notifying all half-blood apprentices and dark-blood students to retire at their dormitories for their nine o'clock night sleep. It shrieked like a teapot unremembered over the fire, incessantly, playing the most nerve-wracking metal sound that used to wake me up every morning for my training sessions and reminded me of the respite and repose time every evening. Nevertheless, I barely heard it today. I had already come to my dormitory early enough in search of the amount and the kind of clothing I should take with me. I definitely needed thick clothes because of the freezing cold that permanently resided here on the Rocky Mountains, but not that many so they wouldn't burden me on my trip. Not many. Bearing this in mind, I stood over my narrow bed trying to make up my mind which of the two pieces of clothing lying before me I should take, the cardigan or the sweatshirt, maybe both. No, no, I couldn't possibly take both. My rucksack would become heavy enough and I wanted it to be as light as possible. Damn it, why can't I just move about in the snow only in thin clothing like all the rest of the dark bloods? This low temperature endurance they had was so beneficial and goddamn irritating at the same time. We half-bloods, being half-dark bloods, were supposed to have inherited this gift. So why did I always suffer out in the cold? I sighed and finally stuffed the sweatshirt in the rucksack without folding it first. I took the cardigan too. 
I put it on above my already thick sweater, knowing that the combination of the two thick garments would hinder my movements. But I had no choice. I needed as many clothes as possible to protect myself from the cold. Now what else? I looked around my tiny dormitory, in case I could remember any further essentials. My small wooden desk below the window was messy. I had thrown all the useless stuff there. My single-door closet was also standing open, and my scant clothes were untidy and thrown haphazardly. Normally I should have had my rucksack prepared since yesterday, but I would have taken the risk of bumping into some sudden evening inspection our generals used to make as they swept into our dormitories in the middle of the night to check on us. If something like that happened last night, they would have seen my rucksack and the empty closet. They would have suspected what I was planning to do, especially if they considered my past and my previous attempts to run away. I would have gone under interrogation and might have ended up in solitary confinement like the previous times. I couldn't possibly take such a risk again. Headmaster Lazar had said he wouldn't give me another chance. So now, instead of being outside the academy, I hadn't even set off. It was already... Oh, I wish I knew what goddamn time it was, but I was so absorbed, revising my escape plan in my mind over and over again. It was definitely today that I had to flee from Corvinius Academy. All right, I'm just going to uh, talk about the presentation for a moment, please. Um, so, Maria, something um, quite horrible has happened. Um, what you've done, and it was highlighted there on the screen, actually, and, and Kate, who is our reader, she's live with us now, she's saying when she looked at it, it wasn't as bad as it looks now. What's happened is that you've gone for justification. That means, you know, each line is, looks exactly the same length. The weird way in which the justification has been achieved um, and presents itself in different ways and different, different people see it, different screens and maybe even different programs. The weird way that's been achieved is by inserting extra spaces in between each word. That's not the way that most modern word processing programs do it. So what was happening there with our own sort of little spell checker it was saying there are lots of spaces in between the these words why is that and that's why it made it look so particularly bad on the screen however you know you've got you've got you've got to sort of i don't know what you're doing to make it look like that i couldn't get over it actually i know you, you, you know greater minds than i than mine in the chat room and i'm sure our panelists too could actually get into the text i couldn't even get that far i couldn't get into the text personally i was just too damn distracted um don't don't do any justification basically when, you, when you're sending stuff in i know it gets justified and nicely cast off and all the rest of it when it gets into production when a book goes into production but at this stage in the game when you're, when you're sending manuscript out to an agents like me or to publishers don't justify it don't even use the font you used please this is another useful tip um sans serif fonts look awful when when uh, they're used for type for body type use use a nice serif my favorite is garamond Times New Roman is another alternative that looks a little bit severe. Garamond has got a nice relaxed quality to it. Just some presentation hints there. I think this is an extreme example of presentation that really is working against the manuscript. But Dean, what did you manage to think of, apart from the way it looked? Yeah, I was just writing down Garamond for later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was a little bit, yeah, I was a little bit put off by that as well. Um, what I felt, but, but, but that aside, um, from the start, I think, I think somebody else mentioned this, that the title was a little bit generic, so you yeah. think about the title. The blurb itself, although it was a bit odd, um, I thought it was exciting, and I think um, you hmm. know, there was some potential there, and I think it was of the genre. Um, I mean, you could almost imagine this kind of being one of those kind of YA action movie adaptations, maybe. Yeah, with Tom Hanks. Um, <laughs> but the, 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 the writing itself... Um, I, I actually quite enjoyed it. I think it flowed quite well. Okay, um, good. I thought the character had quite a nice sort of voice. Um, but as many were saying in the chat room, you know, we were looking at the start of the book being like several chapters on, uh, sorry, several paragraphs on packing a bag. Um, 
and we didn't really get to any kind of story until that last line when we knew that the um that the character was fleeing this place but for all the rest of it it was just talking about packing a jumper and things like that and <laughs> we didn't really get much of a story but i think that the only problem is is that they probably started in the wrong place you know so, yeah 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 ab absolutely yeah i mean all i all i got was cardigans and sweatshirts and, <laughs> okay and rucksacks and i'm um i'm really i'm sorry maria i am going to give you some um advice uh, from my opinion anyway for writing a first page but i haven't written a lot down because honestly i just didn't care mm. um about what she was taking with her because i had no idea who she was where she was going why she needed cardigans or jumpers or why it was such a big deal anyway um just chuck the cardigan in go um so in a in a first page or first certainly first chapter anyway i want to see where what and who and uh, and i yeah. you know i want something exciting especially in ya yeah, yeah um, exactly young adults teenagers reading they have so many other things that they could be doing um they need they need to be gripped by a book yeah. and when they do yeah. they will fall in love with it and they will be so passionate about it um but you need to give them something to get passionate about mm. and it's not cardigans well you say that i was actually <laughs> quite keen on cardigans a few years ago and then I, I got into Hawaiian shirts <laughs> instead. But I, I reserved the right in my old age to get back into cardigans, you know. I mean, yeah. yeah, but you're not a teenager. No. True. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, I've got to ask you, numbers. Oh, who's going to go first? <laughs> you are. Go, you are. Oh, You're on the hot seat here. Go on. Okay. Okay. I'm doing it. I'm going. It's just a one for me. Oh. Oh my God. I did. I thought we'd hit rock bottom with Emma when she started out with a two, but she's Sorry, exceeded. No. She's surpassed herself in a negative way. Oh my God, <laughs> Dean. No, I, I'm. I'm going to go two. I'm going to go two. Just, two. And again, yeah, it, it needed to get somewhere. Um, I, I did quite like, um, I quite enjoyed the writing of it. Yeah, okay. The shirts are everything. I know they are, Lex. Lex said something very funny but very cruel earlier this year that COVID-19 is a COVID-19. Quote, I'm afraid you have crows. <laughs> yes, that's good. That's good, but dreadful. Um, oh, so, uh, yeah, what am I going to do? I'm going to... I don't know. I don't know. Actually, I don't. I couldn't get into it. Um, the half blood thing. Yeah. Um, it's presentation really matters. You know. I don't know. <sighs> I've gone on about this. I'm not going to do it again. But it does matter. It really matters. Actually, when you're sending stuff in, it's uh, people often underestimate the importance of presentation. Actually, it can work heavily against you, and it can modestly work in your favour. So, and I think in this case. Maria, it's worked against you, I'm afraid. I'm sorry about that. Let's see what the chat room has scored on that. They've gone for a two as well. They've gone for a two. Emma's been very hard, actually. Very, very hard lady, I think, Emma. Let's let's find out. Emma? <laughs> are we, are we gonna, to be no, fair. No, I don't need you to be fair. I want you to tell me about... Know badges and death on the nile why are they your two the two of most favorite things oh oh my god D death on the nile was on we were watching it on bank holiday monday oh it is my favorite film which one is all that time the, which, uh, the which 1978 version okay. i haven't seen the new version i'm scared to see the new version yeah, because yeah it's probably crap um, isn't it actually yeah yeah, yeah probably, probably. It, it won't yeah. compare it can't compare to angela lansbury in those costumes <laughs> yeah but once I you once you her. know i mean you, you know how it's going to end so i mean yeah. that's the thing about christie isn't it you, i mean I've, I've just actually i've just been reading all christie's again i don't know why i think it's locked down actually it's just made me go weak in yeah. the head but um <laughs> you, you know how they're going to end so why would you read them twice or, or watch them twice um well you know i haven't read uh, christie for absolutely ages it's this it's this film that i'm obsessed with and it is something that ah. comes from my childhood um because i used to watch it with my dad we were mm -hmm. both big Egyptology fans and mm. 
um, growing up in the 80s, it was so exciting to see a film with all of these celebrities in. It, it, I mean, yeah. it's commonplace now. Everybody's yeah. doing a show. No, it was, it was yeah. Days, yeah, it was have, big. Um, yeah. Yeah, to have... Tell us about David badges. Niven why are you so obsessed? Why are you obsessed with badges? Oh, I don't know. I've always loved badges. I collect badges. So anytime I go to a, an author signing or um, something like that, I'm like, you got any, you got any badges? Wow. <laughs> Yeah, and foxes. I'm a child. I'm a I, I thought so too, actually. Yeah. I quite like badges too. I'd have a badger badge. Well, if you got a badger got badge. One. Good. Yeah. That's great. As, as I'd expect from you, a former biologist. Uh, foxes and desert. Foxes first. Foxes. A fox badge as well. Yeah, that would be nice. I'm not averse right. to that. Deserts and desserts. <laughs> what, what is it you've got about those two things apart from the alliteration? So deserts again. This is this is my Egyptology fascination. Ah, I love that. Yeah. Uh, Actually, I love anywhere that's bleak. So I really love. Um, that's why you love pop up submissions so much. Yeah. I love them. <laughs> that's why I give one stars to things because yeah, I'm a yeah, totally. miserable. Yeah. And Buck bleak Rogers. Person. That's on your last number nine on your list of my favourite things by Emma Reed. Buck yes, Rogers. Buck that's Rogers. very retro. It is the reason I love. It's not Buck Rogers per se. It's Wilma Deering. She was my mm. absolute hero growing up because she is. Uh, she's Colonel Wilma Deering, and when I was a kid, that was huge. This woman. Um, yeah. She was a colonel in the army. Wow, a role model. Awesome. Early a role, role model. model. Did and you ever think about that? Because you you became a scientist, but do you ever do you think about going the services or something? Because you wanted to be an astronaut too, didn't you? I wanted to be an yeah. astronaut, but didn't everybody? Yes, actually, I did. Actually, did you? Yeah. Did you, Dean? Uh, uh, probably yeah, at some point, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Little boy. Let's have a look at your website. Tell us what's happening to Milton the Mighty Spider. Mm, what's going on? Let me what's going show on? you what's happening with Milton the Mighty. Yeah, go on. Here it is. Can, can you see that? It's really sh sh sort of shiny uh, and reflecting I can't in my... A bit, a bit higher. Put it a bit higher. I still, it's, it's, it's like someone scrawled over the bottom. I can't read a <laughs> single thing. What is it? <laughs> this is my Chinese version. <gasps> of Chinese. The mighty. Mandarin. Yeah. <gasps> wow. Yeah. What a yeah, thrill. And, it and, you, and you can't understand a word, can you? Look at that. Do you know, I've had a play with Google Translate... Um, and I, I, it doesn't. I don't think it does it quite right. <laughs> it comes up with some really bizarre things. Anyway, I think I hope I haven't written that. Um, but yeah, it's lovely. It's just oh, really beautiful. Very happy for you. That's a wonderful, fabulous. wonderful so, thing. It's, it's fabulous to get that. copies of your books, especially in foreign languages, and especially <laughs> when you have to start reading from the back to the front. That's the best thing in the world. I'm so happy for you. And <laughs> millions you. of Chinese people even now are going, look, that's that, that's that lady. That's a spider lady. Fabulous. Brilliant. <laughs> well, yeah, we're all happy. Three cheers from Latopia to you, Emma. Uh, let's have a look at our fourth submission of the day, shall we? Oh, I recognise that name. That name is currently live on YouTube with us, and that's great. We love that, actually, because, um, you know, we here we are. Hello, Anne-Marie. Thank you, my dear. I, I don't think you'd really want that. <laughs> um... But yeah, we're reviewing your manuscripts and you're reviewing ours and that's the way it should be, really. We give back the night. Why a thriller? We are absolutely into Emma's territory here. Yes, I'm excited. And this is Anne-Marie's blurb. Evie has a secret. She's the notorious street artist Orby and spends her nights painting the streets of Coventry with the help of her art painter Jake. Part art partner Jake. Since the death of her best friend Robin two years ago, street art has been the only thing that makes Evie's life feel worthwhile. However, her secret is threatened when a shadowy figure calling himself Byron starts blackmailing Evie into completing his increasingly dangerous challenges, desperate to avoid arrest and hold on to her street ah, oh, and there it's been truncated I'm sorry we only give you a certain number of characters but I think we get the general idea, Kaylee loves the blurb, you're getting some good comments on the blurb already Hannah loves it our own Annie loves it too title, wow I think we, we could just stop at this point actually go for marks now <laughs> no we can't we've got to get a uh, a handle on who you are. 
I'm a graduate of Warwick University's Creative Writing BA programme with prose and poetry publications in several literary magazines and anthologies, including The Little Book of Fairy Tiles, recently released by Dancing Bear Books. Highly creative, Anne-Marie. We need a highly creative reading, and it's going to be from Kay. The first page. We Give Back the Night by Anne-Marie McQueen. Read by Kay. Chapter 1. With the last hiss of the spray can, Evie adds the final touches to the letter Y, spelling out Orby on the paintwork of the dormant train. She steps back to admire the finished product. Her nighttime alias covers at least half a carriage in bubble font, drowning the corporate logo of the train company under waves of colour. The tag is a complex piece of work. Each letter is made up of several layers, twists of verdant green and gradients of purple. She'd been worried about this one, knowing there was a high chance she wouldn't be able to pull it off. Her hands are shaking after hours of intense concentration and high doses of caffeine. Her fingers numb with cold. Although she's dying to rip the raven black scarf off her face and take a deep breath, she resists, because the air is still thick with a clawing stench of paint. Though it keeps the worst out, the scarf isn't impenetrable, and sometimes the toxic fumes from the spray paint make her light-headed and nauseous. She should probably get a proper mask, but she prefers the feel of the soft, familiar fabric against her skin. You done then? She jumps slightly as Jake walks up behind her, then silently curses herself for not staying alert. A rookie mistake. Nearly, she mutters, tuning back into the familiar nighttime sounds she's become accustomed to. The wind, shuddering trees, an owl's hoots, the distant roar of a car. She's always preferred night to day. There's something comforting about the darkness, the way it hides the imperfections of the world and makes everything look ghostly and beautiful. She loves the silence. She loves the soft amber glow cast by the street lamps the silvery sheen of metal and the way tarmac glitters when there's enough moonlight. She loves the way buildings become ominous blots against the horizon and the spires of Coventry Cathedral twist upwards into the indigo skyline like thorns. The night gives her the illusion of freedom. She gets out a black sharpie and begins to draw a border around the bubble font. Down here in the tracks the trains seem monstrously huge. Metallic mountains towering over her, closing her in on every side. Spotlights cut through the darkness and illuminate their sleek forms. Jake gets his old DSLR camera out and snaps a photo of her work with a flash on, which annoys her because it's an unnecessary risk. He whistles appreciatively. You've really outdone yourself this time, he says. Everyone's going to be dead impressed when they see this tomorrow morning. It'll probably be gone by then. She says, though she can't hide a smile. Does it matter? We've got the photo evidence. Old Zephyr would be proud. Zephyr is their idol. The guy practically invented freight train tagging. True. Maybe if we're lucky they won't clean it off. Maybe it'll get up to Leeds or Newcastle. Jake claps her shoulder cheerfully and takes a few more photos from different angles. That's the spirit. Take the north first and then the rest of England. She shakes her head at him in fond exasperation. We're not planning an invasion here, aren't we? There's amusement in his eyes. During the day they're a pale blue-grey colour, but in this silvery glow they darken into a shade of midnight blue. Come on, she says suddenly, aware that they've already wasted too much time here. We should go. Jake puts his camera away. She gives her masterpiece one last appraising glance, searching it for mistakes before turning her back on it. They can't afford to stay out in the open where they could be seen. The whole point of doing this at night is to keep their identities secret and protect their dual lives. Street art isn't exactly a legal hobby. Just as they turn to leave the train yard, she hears something which makes her freeze in place. Distant voices, footsteps, getting closer. Straight over to you on this, Emma. Um, yes, I am loving this. It is 100% YA 
um it's got great voice i like the character i like the active scene where it started uh if i've got one tip for the writer that would be stay in the scene so just get rid of the um she's always preferred night to day kind of uh, sort of bit of in- introspection um just stay with the scene with the characters because it's going really well i think um i mean i was hooked by the blurb but the the pages didn't disappoint good good all right dean yeah yeah again very similar um i i too really like the blurb and i think the blurb is very intriguing um and as some i think that's some of us said in the chat room i think it's, it's a good title as well yeah. Um, and yeah, the, the writing was very engaging. I mean, I, I found that I was very quickly absorbed into the story within, you know, within a couple of lines. I, was, I felt like I was there. Um, and again, yeah, we were introduced to the character that very quickly, and we had a bit of action going on there. Um, I think that there was a couple of people said it was slowing down a little bit towards the end, which which perhaps it was. Um, but personally, I, I would have stuck with it and carried on reading. You would have done. Okay, so there's an issue that um, was raised in the chat room, uh, a YouTube actually comment, uh, and this this kind of has some impact on the commercial process of the book actually. Um, Emma, what do, how do you feel about this? Uh, we are actually talking about vandalism here. About vandalism and about the graffiti, yeah. the tagging. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I don't know how that's going to be explored. Uh, further throughout the book but I think in terms of a topic for uh, YA writing I think it's very um, valid and relatable I agree. I agree. and I'd be very interested to see that yeah. I mean I can you know I can see the cover would be amazing and yeah. we can have a discussion about um, what is art what is vandalism yeah, well, we will have a discussion about that. Let's have a mini discussion about that right now because it it, 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 it affects the commercial prospects. Now, I, let me tell you about uh, a friend of mine who's a, who's a director, and he did a piece for a magazine program on television some years ago now when tagging first started, and he just followed a uh, tagging gang around for I think a couple of nights or so and went out and it was a neutral piece is is good piece, but but neutral. He was prosecuted very very intensively by the police. Uh, not for saying this is a good thing, not for encouraging people to do it, but simply because he filmed people in the action and it was broadcast on television. And it's actually, I mean, you, you can Google it now, in fact. And it was quite uh, quite a big law uh, case. It went to the High Court and he was found not guilty. But, you know, the horrible thing going to the High Court. And interesting, the police took that view. I don't know if they take that view today. I don't know if it would be a major drawback for a publisher just dealing with a subject like that. I hope not. What do you think, Dean? I mean, at the end of the day, it's fiction, isn't it? You know, I mean, yeah. I, I guess there's a thing of, of uh, is it going to encourage young adults to go around mm. spraying train carriages? Maybe, but I, I, I think, you know, I mean, there's, there's probably worse things in YA. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we get murders in, you know, like Twilight. I mean, what's that about, you know? What's going yeah, on there? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, quite right. Yeah, I mean, Absolutely. even like things like Harry Potter, I mean, you know, there's murders and stuff going on in them. So, yeah. And yeah. young adults, they're not seven, eight years old, they're probably. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, you've got things like Banksy and that as well, haven't you? It's, it's, it's yeah. like the whole kind exactly. of culture exactly. of street art now. And, and I know this is talking about the illegal stuff, but there are places where the councils are places where there's, there's walls and things put aside for young artists to do their graffiti, and it's, you know, it's kind of sanctioned by <laughs> so, them. Yeah, so we got we got Gats though. He doesn't like doesn't like tagging at all. He doesn't want to ride in a train that's got the uh, the old graffiti <laughs> on the side. I think um, I think what what I would uh, suggest actually, Anne Marie, is just moving um, really quite soon. Actually, is 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 just finding out the passion. I don't see the passion uh, of our protagonist at the moment. She's doing it, yeah, but why is she doing it? There's something that she's expressing there. There's a reason for her to do it. I don't know what it is. What's going on? But um, there's something that we we need to to bring out there. Why she's got to do it. That's why she's driven to do this. And um, I'd like to see that. I'd, I'd like a bit more voice. I'd like a bit more immediacy. I, what I'd really like, actually, is to be able to talk about this in uh, one of the huddles that we do every Saturday inside Latopia. But we don't talk about huddles. That's the first rule of huddles. Emma, numbers, please. Uh, I think this is a 100% YA. It's right on target for me. I'm going to give it a four. Oh. You gave me a little flutter just then. I thought we were going for five. You said 100%. You meant 80%. You're a scientist. You know what you're talking about. Dean. 
Uh, yeah, eighty percent from me as well. Yeah, a four from Dean. We have no sound effects today, so sorry about that. And I think the agent. Yeah, the agent's going to go for four as well. Let's see what the uh, the chat room, the genius room, is doing on that. We're just waiting for mine to go up. I think it's going to be quite good. Wouldn't you say? Yeah, it's an 80. Anne-Marie, you're with us live. You've witnessed your 80 percenting by everybody today. It's not bad. You could be the winner. We don't know. We've got one more to look at today. And it's Revenge Body. It's dark comedy. It's from Lucy. And this is Lucy's blurb. Revenge Body is a darkly comic novel about the deadly cost of beauty. When Ellery Haywood gets involved with a multi-level marketing weight loss scheme run by her mother's new boyfriend, she soon discovers she's shilling something far darker than diet pills and the corruption in her little Welsh town runs deeper than the River Tor. That's interesting. Yeah, I would too, actually, Annie. How interesting. Yeah, I absolutely would. Let me tell you about uh, Lucy. Uh, I've recently finished my PhD in creative writing at Brunel University, she says, where I worked on my novel with Will Self as my supervisor. Oh, that's great. That would have been interesting. Why don't you see if Will wants to come on the show? Send him an invite from us. We would love to have him on as a guest. It would be terrific, actually. Um, Will has said, Revenge Body at once has important things to say about the further objectification and commodification of the human body under late capitalism. Sounds like Will Self. Uh, while also being laugh out loud funny. Good combination. And by the way, what a good idea to get uh, a great quote from a known writer, actually. That always does a lot of good with a submission, so well done for thinking about that. Uh, during my studies, I worked as a personal trainer and fitness instructor um, and gained a first-hand insight into the toxic culture surrounding the diet and fitness industry. These experiences inspired me to write, re write Revenge Body, a work which explores these themes in a tongue-in-cheek manner. The novel will appeal to readers of both Joseph Heller and Amanda Filipacci because of its humorous and often scathing look at contemporary culture. It sounds too good to miss, and it sounds like we should ask Martin to read it. The first page. Revenge Body by Lucy, read by Martin. Chapter One. In a small room, in a small flat, two figures faced one another. It was cold outside, but far colder on the top floor of the mid-terrace house they shared. It was late September, and there was an unseasonable chill in the air, but the couple refused to turn the heating on until the dying days of December. It was a discomfort that each blamed on the other. She was cheap, he was tight. The house was freezing. Their living room was an arena for a gladiatorial contest of wills to see who could remain silent the longest. Ellery and Marcus were born and raised in a town that was known only for its above average suicide statistics. They resisted the adolescent impulse to slash their wrists or chase down paracetamol with vodka and swing from the ceiling fans. They survived the turbulent teenage years, the roar of their twenties, and were creeping through the boredom of their early thirties towards a dark middle age. Birdwater was a town in South Wales, on the outskirts of the capital city's attention. It was a place to be passed through on the way to somewhere else. The town centre had been emptied by the outsourcing of fashion stores and coffee chains to the discount retail park off the M4. Charity shops and e-cigarette emporiums had taken the place of repossessed restaurants and out-of-business bakeries. The people of Birdwater no longer visited the local butcher or did the weekly shop at the greengrocers. They decided against walking five minutes down the road for disappointment when a five-minute drive delivered them a panoply of consumer delights. Though Ellery had lived in Birdwater all her life, she knew little of its outlying areas. She held vague recollections of childhood car rides to the seaside with sand buckets and picnic hampers, but she would have been amazed to learn that the endless journey had only been 15 minutes. She remembered being buckled into her booster seat, watching the concrete of the town transform into acres of farmyards and orchards which gave way to limestone cliffs and drifting sand of the curved shore. 
Her father would sit beside her, his hands loose on the steering wheel as he hummed an off-key hallelujah with Leonard Cohen. Her mother pointed to fields of grazing sheep, grazing sheep and horses as though they were new inventions. Ellery paid so little attention to them that they may as well have been. She saw them each time anew and forgot them as soon as she reached home. What sound does a cow make? Her mother would demand to know, hell-bent on educating her idiot daughter. Ellery would shrug. She did not care. She was eight years old and her parents were beginning to worry. Scenery did not interest her. She did not need fresh air and sunlight. She preferred to be inspired by the majesty of nature from the comfort of the indoors, watching Blue Planet on a 4K plasma television screen with an easily accessible bathroom and, and lap full of snacks. The outside world unsettled her. She held tight to the centre of the town for fear it would not hold. She did not own a car and she did not like to walk. Her flat was equidistant from the Chinese takeaway and Tesco's. Domino's delivered to her doorstep. Nothing more was necessary. As a teenager, she had been restless, dreaming of life outside the limits of her hometown. Family holidays gave her a glimpse of big cities and bright lights. Books and movies filled her head with daydreams of cig cigarettes along the Seine, literary salons with intellectual Manhattanites and sunsets watched from the balcony of her big city apartment. Time had stripped her of these pretensions. She no longer pretended to read Proust. She struggled through Gordon Ramsay's autobiography on Audible. French desserts were all that connected the two men through the centuries, but Ellery was a sucker for butter. Time diminished her ambitions. Birdwater was enough for her. Okay, so Martin is with us. We are graced by his presence today. I'm very pleased uh, to have him here. Right at the top there, he says, smart, assured, writing, entertaining, telling in the opening. I definitely read on. Love the wry, bittersweet tone. Four from me, says Martin. He's our narrator. He should know because he's inside that manuscript and inside the author's head right now. What did you think, Dean? Um, there was elements I liked about it. I think the blurb was very good at the start and again i was very my, my ears sort of pricked up when i heard dark comedy because that is right that's not yeah. right my wheelhouse kind of thing um and it, it was a good blurb um i think as others had said in the chat room we didn't perhaps quite get that laugh out loud funniness i mean it was witty um, we got the darkness there certainly um and there was little bits in there that i thought were witty and they did kind of make me chuckle but it wasn't, I wouldn't have said it was hilarious, for, you know. Yet, anyway. Do we? Um, what do we? What do you expect? Anne Marie has just made an interesting comment about um, uh, about this dark thing. What I mean, let me ask you: dark comedy, right? This is the genre. Do you expect to laugh out loud with dark comedy? Not necessarily, but I mean that, that's kind of what we were promised in the blurb that it was going to be. I think that was. I mean, literally, I think they, they did say in the blurb it was going to. Will be, said that. Will was laughing. Know, yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. maybe it gets there. But I mean, again, and it's all subjective anyway, isn't it? And as I say, I was enjoying it, and there was humour there for me. Um, uh, you know, I just think, and again, as some were saying in the chat room, they were probably expecting a, a little bit more humour there. Um, and, I, and I think, I think a couple of people took issue with the suicide um, reference that was mm. put in there quite early. Mm. Um, and then again, my only other kind of concern, it, it, this was another controversial thing in the, in the chat room where some, some people didn't take, didn't have a problem with it and others did. It was that there was a little bit of that telling going on. Yeah. Um, and, and that backstory kind of kept slipping in there, um, you know, which was kind of bringing us away from the immediate scene. Yeah. Um, uh. but, but again, all in all, the writing, the, the writing was enjoyable. And again, I, once again, I probably would carry on with it. You carry on reading. That's a good sign, Emma. Yeah, I, I want to laugh out loud at dark comedy and then I want to feel really bad for doing it. Yeah. I want to, <laughs> <laughs> I want to find something funny and then hope that nobody saw, you know. Yeah. Um, but as I think I said before, I like a first page to um, set the scene for the future of the book that I'm about to read. And I want to see that this is dark comedy. Yeah. Uh, right from the get-go you know i love corruption in a little welsh town i love oh, the sound yeah. of that we could definitely really be playing on that um i think there's no argument that the, the craft was really good the writing's tight 
Um, but I'd like the writer to choose a time frame and stick to it for a little while. So are we in the cold flat or are we in the car uh, when she's eight years old mm. or, you know, when she's a teenager? Let's just um, get a solid grounding in the in the characters first and the town. That would be nice. And some, yeah, yeah. let's have some, let's have some sniggers. All right. <laughs> uh, yes, a little a rice negra and a little dark humour yeah. there. Uh, I thought, uh, Lucy, this is, uh, this is unusual for me. I thought that it, this, this this grew on me, actually. Yeah, first time round, I, I think uh, I'd have pretty much said the same as everyone else. Uh, second time round, because I, you know, I have to knit the audio and the video files together, um, which I do on Sunday mornings. Um, so it gives me a chance to do it. I, I, I read this twice. I liked it a lot more on the second time round. And um, I think that's partly a tribute to you and the depth of your writing, but also I think it's a bit of an issue because you really need to, to grab the reader by the throat and not let go uh, to begin with. Um, I particularly liked the nicely claustrophobic, um, not atmosphere exactly, but environment, the, the, the little town. I could feel those walls closing in on me the second time round that I that I read that. I thought that was really effective. Um, but basically, I'm going to go and agree with Emma that I, I would really prefer the characters to tell the story, and I'll make my own mind up about you know the the things that you're kind of telling me at the moment. I prefer that. Emma, a number three. Three from Emma. All right. Dean, please. Oh, it's going to be a tough one, isn't it? <gasps> you want, you want a decimal four. point. I'm going to go four. And, and that's, that's against a lot of... Uh, yeah, that's against what everybody else is saying, but I just, I just quite enjoyed it. Yeah, well, fine. That's, absolutely, that's the whole point, really. I'm going to do that, too, because I think there's, there's more in it than meets the, the eye first time round. Um, and I, I do like it, but I'm not mad about the the amount of authorial commentary going on. I think that's a little off-putting. Note, you've got the living laboratory that is our wonderful chat room, the genius room, Lucy. They were kind of saying the same thing too, so you might want to take, take note of that. Um, let's see what the overall voting looks like, shall we? Wow. So basically, at the moment, Lucy is number two. And Anne-Marie, who's live with us right now on YouTube, is number one, 80%. I guess it's going to be those two who are duking it out. Make um, your pop-up submission. This is your chance to make a submission. Subs.latopia.com There you go. I couldn't hear that. Hopefully you could. And Dean, another, another great show with another great... Uh, our guest, whose name is Dean, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for uh, to, to Kaylee for allowing uh, her to uh, uh, you to use her bookshelf. I made a mess out of that, but you know what I mean. Um, this is your final chance to change any vote. Do you want to change any one of your votes? Um, no, I think I think I'll stick. You're going to stick with that. Fabulous, and Emma, terrific to see you. Even better to hear you. Do you want to change any votes? Good to see you too. No, I'm steadfast. All right, I'm that's to great. My guns. Totally understand. Thank you, Anne Marie. Don't forget to vote on today's show. Yes, I hope you do. I hope you do. Really do hope you vote uh, in the next six and a half days. Thank you, everyone who made it such a great show. Everyone has contributed today. Let's do it again next week.
inside